I'm Donald Bell for Cool Tools, and as some of you know, I love working on electronics projects. So in this video, I've rounded up some of my favorite inexpensive tools for working with electronics. First up, the Avon Adjustable Circuit Board Holder. Helping hands tools are really a matter of personal taste. None of them are perfect, and this one's no different. But for the price, it really nails a couple of cool tricks. The first one is that once you secure an unpopulated circuit board in here, wedging it in the grooved spring-loaded grippers, you can quickly flip it back and forth. This is great when you need to drop in a component from the front, bend the leads, flip it over to solder it up, and then flip it back for the next component. With this, it's easy. There are thumb screws to tension everything up just the way you want, and it sure beats working off a table, and it's more rigid than a flexible arm clip. The second thing this is great for is desoldering components. If you screwed up and you need to take something out, you can heat on one side and pull or pry from the other. Or if you're using a solder sucker, you can really just rest your hand on this thing and get right up to the spot without having to chase it. That's all there is to it. It's a simple and inexpensive tool, but relatively well built, and I'm surprised I don't see them more often. Next up, my favorite flush cutters from Hacko. For more years than I care to admit, I would cut and trim wires and circuit leads using these generic wire cutters. They'd get the job done, but because the blades are somewhat recessed, you could never trim things completely flat. For that, you need flush cutters, and it's a subtle distinction, but these are so much more satisfying when you're cleaning up the bits of wire on a project. Because the cutting edge is moved all the way out front, you can take that cut right down to the board if you want. And here's a quick tip. I learned this from watching Sar Drimmer from Boldport solder up his beautiful projects. Typically, when you solder a connection together on a through-hole circuit board like this, you get what looks like a little mountain of solder. Then you can come back through and trim it down, and maybe you get something like this. And it's tidy, and it gets the job done. But these days, with project boards that are almost works of art in themselves, here's a technique for making solder joints that are prettier and smoother to touch. Take that same joint you just made and use flush cutters like these $5 hackos to trim the joint right down to the board. Then come back around with your soldering iron, reheat the connection very quickly, and hit it with just a touch of solder. It takes some practice, but if you get it right, you get a perfect little dome. Something about the surface tension of the new solder and the lack of any central element poking through makes this happen. And when you apply this technique over an entire board, it almost looks like it's been put together with little rivets. It's a nice look and it's smooth to touch. You can clean up the extra flux with a swab of isopropyl alcohol and you've got a board worth showing off. You don't need any special soldering iron or solder to make this technique work, but you really do need the flush cutters to get up right against the board. I've got a link to these exact ones in the description. Speaking of soldering irons, here's one that runs off USB. Let me say up front that I am a big fan of portable soldering irons when they're done right. I've used the $35 Hacko, I've used the $40 Dremel VersaTip, and I even have a separate video directly comparing all three of these. But for this video, let's just focus on this USB soldering iron. Here's what I like about it. Number one, it's skinny. It's the skinniest iron I've ever used, which makes it really nice to hold. All together with the cord, it's just super compact. Two, it's cheap. Even if it's not your favorite soldering iron at $9, you can put one in every kit you have and not be precious about mistreating it. Number three, USB is everywhere. You can plug it into your computer or a portable charger or a wall adapter. There's nothing to recharge. And four, there's built-in safety. Touching this little button turns it on and if you let it go for more than 15 seconds, it turns off automatically. Now, it's definitely not perfect. It only really gets hot enough for general electronic work, and the skinny tip loses heat quickly. Also, while it's portable, it's not exactly cordless. You still have to plug it into something, even if that thing is a portable battery, which also means that if you lose this adapter cable, you're hosed. Still, I'm glad to have it around, and at $9, I think it's a great value just to have as part of your tool bag. Next up, wearable magnifying glasses. I bought these a year ago looking for a way to get a better look at soldering up small stuff. They really are perfect for those times when you're wiring up or painting or gluing up something tiny and delicate. Plus, there's a little LED on the front that helps put a little extra light on things. These come with an interchangeable set of lenses. The most powerful one gives you 3.5 times magnification, 
and this is really the one I leave on most of the time. I honestly wish that went up a little higher, as those lower lenses really don't do much for me. The lenses are plastic, so they can get scratched if you're not careful, which I'm a little guilty of. On the upside, compared to glass, these are lightweight and can be worn for long periods without hurting your face. The lenses also flip up and down so that you can kick in the magnification just when you need it. But by far, my favorite use for these is to put them on and surprise people. They make you look so super nerdy. These should actually be filed under birth control because they are quite possibly the unsexiest pair of glasses ever made. Next, a $10 servo testing board. Servos are one of the coolest weapons in the maker arsenal. Unlike a simple motor which spins either forward or backwards, a servo provides gradual precise movement left or right. They're the steering mechanism in any remote controlled car you've ever played with. But to make a servo work, you have to send it more than just power, you have to send it a control signal too. Otherwise it won't work at all. Now there are relatively easy ways to control servos with an Arduino board or a Raspberry Pi, but you'll have to do some programming, it's not cheap, and you'll need to breadboard some components. It's kind of a hassle. As an alternative, you can get a small, cheap servo tester like this. You can get them smaller and cheaper, but this $10 one from Lawansol has some nice extras. On the left side, you plug in power, anything between four to eight volts. The voltage gets displayed here on the little readout. The terminal block takes any kind of bare wire from a power supply. The other socket here can connect the three prong balance cable of common 7.4 volt RC LiPo batteries. Next to the terminal block, you have these two sets of servo connections. With these, you can hook up either one or two servos and control them simultaneously. On the right side of that, you have this nice knob that gives you a full range of control on the servos. And below that is a toggle button that returns the servo to its center position. I learned about servo control boards from Jonathan Odom's project on making this animatronic 3D printed robot puppet. He used five of them to manually animate his puppet. And for what it's worth, Lawansol has another board that lets you connect and control up to six servos, but I haven't tried it yet. More than anything, I just love how this cheap board gives you a quick way to play around with servos. Last weekend, I used cardboard and some magazine cutouts to quickly mock up a silly design after dinner that probably would have taken me an hour to put together with an Arduino. Next up, a swivel head deburring tool. There are a few different types of deburring tools. This one is a swivel head model made by General Tools. It's essentially a plastic handle that holds a curved metal blade, perfect for smoothing out any sharp edges left behind from cutting metal or plastic. It's a quick tool to use. It's sharp and doesn't take a lot of force. It's commonly used by plumbers to smooth off the rough edges of freshly cut pipe. For me though, I mostly use this for cleaning up holes drilled into metal or plastic project enclosures. Drilling almost always kicks up some rough bits that prevent switches or buttons from sitting flush. A quick pass with the deburring tool cleans it right up. It's also great for smoothing out rough lines from longer cuts in plastic or sheet metal. For example, on my Hello Kitty go-kart for Maker Faire, I had to carve away a lot of pink plastic with hacksaws and rotary tools. To make everything look a little bit more deliberate, I ran the deburring tool over a lot of it to remove the shredded and melted bits. Next up, a cheap way to hold things down on your workbench. If you do any soldering, you probably have a pair of helping hands or some bulky heavy thing like this that can hold your project or components steady while you wire them. They're useful, but a little clunky to travel with and they're often overkill if you're just splicing a wire or two. In terms of price and portability, poster tack is a great alternative. The first problem it solves is what I call the wandering board problem, where you're pushing your project around the table as you're trying to solder it up. Using a glob of tack to temporarily fix your board in place makes the job a lot easier. The second problem solved by tack is component to component soldering. Maybe you need to put a resistor on the leg of an LED or splice two wires together. Everyone has their way of doing things, but for me, in terms of convenience, few ways are faster than just sticking the pieces down with tack and hitting it with some solder. Next, a powerful pocket microscope. I half bought this thing just to see what a tiny $6 microscope even looks like. It comes in this flimsy box and understandably is mostly plastic, but what you get is fairly impressive. 
The microscope itself is just this passive lens system that you can focus with your hand, but you also get this series of LEDs that you can switch on to add extra light. Switch one way, you can look at things under a UV light, which is apparently handy for seeing anti-counterfeit marks on money. I had microscopes as a kid, but they were always this classic style where you had to put samples on a slide and they were more or less fixed things. What surprised me about this cheap, tiny microscope is how much fun it can be just to take it to anything out in the world. The wood grain on a table, the tread of a bike tire, the print in a comic book, all of these hidden worlds open up and you can just instantly peek at them. If you have kids, it's a slam dunk. Even if they already have a standard microscope like my kid, the reaction to this was totally different. Beyond the novelty, I found this to be useful a few times for inspecting electronics projects and troubleshooting connections, or reading little component values or serial numbers. And I should also mention that I was able to use this with my smartphone camera to take close-up photos or videos. That's actually how I shot a lot of this video here. So you can somewhat think of this as a super macro lens adapter for your phone. Finally, an assortment of heat shrink tubing. Of all the things I have in my electronics toolbox, nothing gets my kid more excited than seeing me use heat shrink. The stuff is honestly magic. Plus there's usually fire involved, so bonus. If you're unfamiliar, these are plastic tubes that you slip over connections that shrink tight when heat is applied. It's a pro way to keep wires and components from shorting into each other. It's a real lifesaver when you're splicing two wires together and you want that splice to be sealed up like the rest of the wire. You just cut the length you need, slip it on before you solder, and then heat it in place when you're done, either with a heat gun, a mini butane torch, or even a lighter or soldering iron if you're in a pinch. Heat shrink is one of those tools I totally take for granted until I show it to someone who's never seen it before and it blows their mind. This 200 piece multi-pack is a great introduction, though it doesn't include the really fat one and a half inch tubes needed for that pie enclosure. It works on an Adafruit trinket though, and for basic wiring, you really can't beat the price. So those are some of my favorite inexpensive tools for working with electronics. None of them are essential, but all of them have come in handy for me, and you can find Amazon links to each and every one of them in the video description down here, and you can find thousands of reader recommended tools at cool-tools.org.